counterfactual simulation model of causal difference. The microphone has run out of batteries. As soon as I've got new ones in, we'll fight about kill you. So I'll shout a little bit at the beginning and then stop talking about anybody wants to have the mic, I guess. So yeah, I'm, I'm Toby Gessenberg. I'm a postdoc in Josh Tenenbaum's lab. Josh actually had to leave, so I'm going to blame him if anything goes wrong today. <laughs> and these are kind of the, the three, big top, three big topics that I'm working on in my research. So I'm interested in how people attribute responsibility to each other, how people make causal judgment, and specifically what the role of common, what role counterfactuals play for how we do this. My key inspiration for like getting into this was when in my masters, when I was a student of David Lanyardes at UCL. I came across that book, and I thought it was really exciting because it talked about something that I'm interested in, and it had all these graphs, and um, you better stop. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, Shut up. It had all these graphs and all these formulas, and it looked very scientific and exciting. And what, what really got me, got me, what sold me on that was then when I saw Dave give all these cool talks about like crime stories and how he used this formalism to model how people are making inferences about who's guilty and, and, and that was really what sold me. And then more so, like once I started reading the work of just a sample of people that I put up here, um, who have all argued that it's really, like causality is a really central um, aspect for understanding co um, cognition. And the idea of us building causal models of the world and that we can understand certain cognitive functions as operations over those causal models of the world, I, I, I found to be a very powerful idea. So the, the focus of this talk is going to be on understanding how I make causal judgments. And Chris set me up quite nicely, so there are going to be a, a, a few references here and there to what, what he was talking about earlier. But this, this is joint work with Noah, Dave Yada, and, and Josh Tenenbaum. who all look a little bit different now, but I, I like his pictures. <laughs> Dave looks the most different now. <laughs> um, OK, so let's, let's picture yourself in, in front of your computer at home as a normal amateur participant. And, and you're being asked to make a causal judgment. So there's going to be these two billiard balls coming in from the, in the scene, and I'm going to ask you whether you think that this gray ball A caused for B to go through the gate. Okay, because because humming is more fun than, than raising an arm, I'm going to ask you to hum if you think that ball A caused for B to go through the gate. Who thinks well they didn't cause for me to do the gate? Um, okay, so this is pretty very good replicating replicating what I, what I find. So so now, now what was going in your what was going on in your mind when, when you were doing this? Here's what I think what was going on. Maybe you have been biased a little bit by Chris's thought, but maybe also that's just a natural thing for you to do. So I think what people are doing is saying, well first I look at what actually happened. The balls collided, B went through the gate. And that's obviously uncontroversial. The thing that's a little bit more controversial is to say, well, people are also meant to be simulated, but what has happened if the candidate cause hadn't been present in the scene? So you're trying to, to estimate, well, if A hadn't been there, what would have happened to B? And the more sure you are that the outcome in this counterfactual world would have been different from the one that actually happened, the more you're likely to say that all A caused all B to go through the gate. That's the, that's the general idea. Now, you may be wondering, okay, what else? That seems obvious, but what else could I possibly be doing? So one idea of what else you could be doing is um, an idea of a color ball, which is inspired by these more like process theories of, of causality. So where it's not about counterfactuals, but, but where it's about the forces of how a patient and age, agent um, interact with each other, and that, is, that I just need to look at this configuration of forces in order to be able to tell whether this was a case of causation. So here, for example, have this cone going this way, have this force, the agent applies a certain force, as a result it hits the cone, and just this configuration of forces is what I need to assess in order to be able to say that it was causation. But crucially, this model doesn't assume that people do any kind of counterfactual simulation thinking about what would have happened if the cause hadn't been present in the scene. So we, we very much like this work. And I remember an email that, that Josh wrote me a while back of saying, like, oh, um, Steve Pinker in his book, Stuff of Thought, writes so much about this work. And I think he was a little bit jealous and wanted Steve Pinker to write a little bit more about this work as well. So we should, should follow up on that. <laughs> and there were kind of two, two key problems that we saw like, that related to this work. One problem being the problem of generalization. So the stuff about forces seems pretty cool, but, but I just have a few other examples of kind of sensible causal statements that we can make where it's not so clear anymore like how we would think about those in terms of like force configurations. That was one, one problem that we saw. The other problem that we saw that we thought it's not going to be possible to do away with counterfactuals. So the counterfactuals are really crucial for understanding how people make causal judgments. Um, for those of you who, who 
who uh, read a little bit about causality or about philosophizing, um, you may have heard that there's many different ideas about um, what, what causation could be, and there are many accounts that think that have then argued that it it's, it's a very pluralistic notion. We have these process ideas, things bumping into each other, but also more kind of abstract, counterfactual ideas, and maybe they don't really go into one bigger concept, but, but they're separate concepts out there. What I'm going to try to argue a little bit in this talk is to say, okay, all these things that um, philosophers have identified and psychologists have tested are, are important, but maybe we can aim for a little bit of a unificationary approach. That's what I'm going to try to do. And I'm going to try to argue a good way of understanding causal judgments is by thinking about counterfactuals over probabilistic generative models that's kind of combining all these different colors. Okay, just a quick outline. I'm going to start um, with a simple experiment, very much like the one that, you, that, that you've just seen. Then it gets a little bit more exciting by adding this brick into the world. Make a little bit of a huge difference. Um, then I'm going to do some eye tracking, which will be cool. And then finally, looking into situations where there's more causes, which will get us a little bit to what um, Chris was talking about earlier. On. Okay, let's start with number one. The pictures are always like the people who were on, on that project, mostly the same people. Let's see it a couple of times. Okay, again, just to repeat the general idea, but what are people are doing? Well, they're, they're, they're interested in assessing to what extent, like here, an object, like ball A, was a cause of an event. B is going through the gate. And they do so by taking into account what actually happened, then considering removing the candidate causal object from the scene and assessing to what extent they believe that the counterfactual outcome would have been different from the one that actually happened. Okay. So in this experiment, we show participants a bunch of different video clips and we varied whether or not B went through the gate. So here in the top, we have situations where B missed. Here we have situations where B goes through the gate. And we also varied how um, close the counterfactual would have been. So here are situations where B clearly would have missed if A hadn't been there. Here is where it would have been close. And here are situations where B would have gone through the gate even if um, A hadn't been there. Okay, so what would we predict based on our account? So predict in this particular situation here, they shouldn't say that A prevented B from going through the gate. It didn't go through, but it was also clear that it wouldn't have gone through anyhow. And that's what people do. We get our model prediction here by simply asking another set of participants the counterfactual question directly. So we ask them, do you think that B would have gone through the gate if A hadn't been there? And then we just take those judgments to predict people's causal judgments. So in some sense, this model here doesn't have any free parameters. So we can do the same thing here. And here people say, oh, maybe to some extent it prevented it. And we believe that they do so because they don't know whether B would have gone through the gates in this case if um, or A hadn't been there. And then finally, in the situation where it's really clear that B would have gone through the gate, they say, yes, A prevented B from going through. And we see the same or the reverse relationship for causation. So when it's clear that B would have missed, then they say, yeah, A caused it to go through. When it's kind of unclear what would have happened, yeah, it caused it somewhat less. And when it was clear that it would have gone in anyhow, they don't say it caused it to go through the game. So those were just six examples. We had 18 clips overall, and just directly um, that relationship between counterfactual judgments of one group and cause judgments of another group was, was very, very strong. So first, pretty good evidence that something like that might be going on. Now I'm going to use this reviewer number two here as a sort of like internal critic. Maybe, maybe there's still something wrong with that. And what this, what this reviewer notices is to say, well, you have all these different clips, but they're all they're different in terms of the counterfactuals, but they're also different in terms of what actually happened. So maybe if you just try a little bit harder, you can come up with an actualist model that can explain people's causal judgments. So that's where this exciting break comes in. Hello. Because instead of like trying to come up with a better kind of uh, actualist model, I just say, okay, let's do an experiment that sort of rules it out in some sense. Uh, that, that's easier for me to do. So what I did is I just created uh, clips that were where what actually happened was identical. Right? So in both of these situations, A and B, interacting exactly the same way. And the only thing I manipulated between the clips was where this brick was placed. Right? And then what people say in the clip here on the left, they don't say that A prevented B from going through the gate, presumably because they think, well, the brick would have prevented it later anyhow. Whereas if they move the brick out of the way, they do say it prevented it. Similarly for causation, but in this clip here they say it caused it because the brick would have been in the way. In this clip they don't really say it caused it because the brick would not have been in the way. So here we have now situations where what actually happened is exactly the same. We only manipulated what the counterfactual would have been and find strong influences on people's other judgments. <coughs> okay, one more kind of fun audience participation thing. Um, so I'm going to show you another clip and we're going to do the humming game again. So do you think that ball A prevented ball B in this case? So who thinks it prevented it? Who thinks it didn't prevent it? Okay, that's kind of, maybe your hands are easier. <laughs> um, let, me, let me show you another clip. Okay, so 
But you may have a little bit of an aha moment if, if that worked. Because previously I didn't tell you anything about these two objects, right? But this clip demonstrates that what this is is actually a teleport. So the ball goes in here and comes out here, and it just works for ball B because I can do whatever I want in this little world. But now that you know this, you might actually be getting a different judgment for this case. Because now you would say, oh no, A actually did prevent me from going through the gate because what I just did is I changed the release about the world, and now your current faction looks different. So in this case, I didn't have to change anything about the scene, I didn't have to move a brick, I just changed your belief about the world, and that changes your positive judgment for you. Um, again, we've done, sorry, did a whole bunch of those cases, and again, we find this very close relationship between causal and common factual judgments. Um, so, review a twisted critical, saying, okay, you have these high correlations, but how, how can you really be sure that that's what people are doing? And that's not where, where eye tracking comes in. Because that's a nice way of seeing what people are actually doing when they're making these judgments. Two new people on the team. Um, yeah, what we did in this experiment, we had three different conditions. We had a causal condition, where they asked to say, did it cause it, did it prevent it, depending on the outcome. A counterfactual condition, where they've come to the gate. And in some sense, a control condition, where they just asked to evaluate the outcome. Did it completely miss the gate? Um, did it go through the middle of the gate, depending on the outcome again? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna show you, like now from one participant, um, a clip who was in these observation conditions. They were asked to say whether they think that he completely missed the gate. And, and, this, and the clip is going to go at half speed, and you'll see the little blue dot that shows you where the person is looking. So, look, most of the thing at 12B, then with back and forth between A and B. Anticipating a little bit where, where B is going to go. And that's, that's kind of it. So, now I'm going to show you a clip from a participant who saw the same clip, but had, was answering a different question. So, he was asked to say this situation whether he thinks that ball A prevented ball B from going through the game. And that's the looking pattern. <coughs> and yeah, you can imagine that I was very happy. If, you, if, your, theory of mind, <laughs> if your theory of mind works, then you can anticipate that I was very happy with this, because you probably hopefully saw that there was a bunch of times the person tried to anticipate where he would have gone if ball A hadn't been there. Like, sampling several times trying to anticipate to make it this kind of tricky case here, make a judgment of whether uh, A really prevented people from working from the game. There's different ways of analyzing this data, of course, it's exciting. I normally work just with judgmental data, so it's kind of nice to have, oh, rich, rich data. Um, I'll just show you one simple way of analyzing it, which is just looking at um, the clip until the time at which the balls collided, and then looking at where the people saccade, where were the endpoints of their saccade. And then we can just classify looks that are sufficiently close to this common factual path that Bob E would have taken as common factual looks. So here in the causal condition for this particular clip, this is like how the participants looked overall. So we find quite a few of those common factual looks. In the common factual condition, like of course, in the sense we find these common factual looks, because we ask them to say whether they think Bob E would have gone through the gate. But in the observation condition, there are much fewer of those common factual looks. So it's not that in general people try to anticipate what Bob E would have gone. Um, but it's specifically when they try to make to answer a common question. That's when we put across a bunch of clips. Um, so and it, and it holds up basically more of common factual looks in the causal condition than, than in its observation condition. Um, also, what was kind of neat is that we can look at now individual participants and see um, is there a relationship between their eye tracking data and their judgment data? Right? And we do find that. So we do find that participants who make more common factual looks that their causal judgments are also better predicted by this common factual simulation model. Whereas people who don't really look that much, um, not. Okay. Um, again, the reviewer is not satisfied. He's not satisfied, but he says, okay, so far we've only looked at these simple one-cause situations. So what, what happens if we have um, several causes in the mix? So that's what we're going to do now. Three balls instead of two. Um, okay, so here's just an example. That's maybe like somewhat already like Chris Hitchcock motivated. A, sim a simple causal chain, right, where B bumped to A bumped to B. And so we show participants these clips and then ask them to say to what extent they thought ball A was responsible for um, E going through the gate or ball B was responsible for E going through the gate. And this is what participants said in this particular clip. So a high like, level of responsibility for ball B and, and also a pretty high uh, level of responsibility for ball A. We also asked just the causal question that doesn't make any difference in this case. Um, so, so what would our model predict for those cases? Right? The model that I told you up until now um, so it would actually predict a really low rating to ball A in this case. But if the only thing that you would be doing is to imagine, well, what if the ball wouldn't have, what if the ball hadn't been there, would the outcome have been different? 
In this case, for A, that's not the case. But even if I removed A from the scene, um, B would have still knocked E through the gate. So the model predicts it should get a really low response to the data in this case. Whereas for well, B, it's fine. Because if well, B hadn't been there, nothing would have happened. So B was clearly the cause in that sense. Um, so what's going on there? Now, another example that philosophers like, uh, that's a double prevention case that hopefully you were able to see. Anticipate that E was going to knock. Uh, a was going to knock E out of the way, but then B knocked A out of the way, and but E just always traveled just by itself. Um, and in this case, those are the judgments that people made. So nothing for A, but pretty low judgment for B. And again, if you take the simple model that I showed you up until now, it correctly predicts that A shouldn't get any responsibility, but it actually over predicts for ball B, because it says, well, if ball B hadn't been there, then A would have knocked E out of the way, so we should get a really high cost of rating. That's all you, you were doing. Um, so that was kind of like how I looked like then for a while. Because um, I wasn't, wasn't so happy with that result, of course. As we grew through it, um, so, so clearly this idea of just removing the ball and thinking what would have happened, whether the outcome would have been qualitatively different is not sufficient for explaining people's causal judgments. Um, so it's not just about the, I'm going to call this like weather causation from now on, meaning like whether or not the ball would have, there, would, would have been there, but that made a difference to whether or not the outcome would have happened. But also about how. So, would, would, the, would the outcome have happened in any different way if, I, if the um, cause had been somewhat different? And here I'm going to uh, borrow, like this also about my idea, my, my idea, but I'm just going to throw a few philosophers up here. I'm not going to read the quotes because I'm probably yeah, running, running a long time. But um, the basic idea is the following. Right? So when I'm, I have one type of causation that I call weather causation, where what I'm doing is I'm imagining removing the ball from the seat and then seeing whether the outcome broadly, broadly construed would have been different from what it actually was. So here, E going through the gate, or E not going through the gate. How I define our position is, in Chris Hitchcock's terms, um, the operation that I'm doing is I'm not removing a ball from the scene, I'm just imagining if I had wriggled it a little bit, or if it had been in a slightly different location, and I'm then interested in whether the outcome event finally construed would have been different from the one that actually happened. But would he have gone through the gate slightly differently at a slightly different point in time? Something along these lines. If I consider both of those things, let's see whether we can make sense of participants' judgments in those cases. Right? For the causal chain, for ball A, it wasn't the weather cause, because if I had removed it, like it um, he would still have gone through the gate, but it was a how cause. If I had changed A a little bit, he would have gone through the gate differently from how it actually did. For ball B, it was a weather cause. If it hadn't been there, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have gone through. And it was also a how cause. If I had changed B a little bit, then E would have gone through the gate differently from what it, from how it actually did. Um, now, in the case of double prevention, if I look at ball A, it wasn't the weather cause. I can remove it. E still goes through exactly the same way that it did. And it wasn't a how cause. If I wiggle it, E is still going to go um, through the gate in the same way. Um, whereas for ball B, it was a weather cause, but it wasn't a how cause. If I change it a little bit, E is still going to go through the gate exactly in the same way that it did. So when we then assume that people care both about how and weather causation, we can make sense of what was previously a slightly puzzling, um, puzzling pattern of results. And, and overall, doing this, like participants actually saw a bunch of different clips, adding how helps. Um, just one, one more point that comes even closer now to what um, Chris was talking about. So, so what about sufficiency? We also know that that's something that people care about when they, when they make causal judgments. So one of, the, one of the clips that we had in there is this of joint causation clip, where E at the beginning is just lying in the middle of the screen, and then A and B both come in, bump in it, and E goes right through the middle of the screen. And, and here, just for ball A, that's um, the rating that participants give. So let's think about this case in terms of the terminology that I, that I introduced. So A was a how cause in this case. If they had a wiggle, it would have been different. A was a weather cause in this case as well. If I had removed A, then B would have knocked E somewhere up there, so it wouldn't have come through the gate. All right, so far so good. Now the case that was also like a case of lower determination. So the only thing that I did here is I moved E a little bit closer to the gate. Right? A and B are still coming in symmetrically, but that now changes the how and weather aspect. Right? So the, the how aspect sorry, is still the same, but A is not now a weather cause anymore of E is going through the gate. Because now even if I remove A, E is still going to go through. But participants give almost an identical rating to ball A in this case. Right, which our model, if it just had these two components, couldn't, couldn't predict because here we have a how cause and another weather cause, here we have a how cause and a weather cause, so the model predicts a higher rating for this case than it does for this case. So here's where the idea of sufficiency comes in, where what we're doing when we're evaluating, or at least that's, that's how we're proposing and inspired by 
by Pearl and um, Halpern and Hitchcock and others, in order to assess sufficiency, what we're doing is, well, we're first imagining, well, what if all B hadn't been there? I remove all other candidate classes from the C, and I think then in that world, would A have been a difference maker for the outcome? Right? And here that's not the case. A, a would have not been sufficient. A is not sufficient because in the world in which I would have removed B, um, A would not have made a difference to the outcome. Right? E misses, doesn't go in, and also doesn't go in, no matter whether, I, um, whether A is there. <coughs> Whereas in this other situation, if I remove B from the scene, A would have been a difference maker. Right? Because now it goes through the gate, and A is there, but it wouldn't have gone through the gate if I had removed A from the scene. So, so by doing this, by adding this other component of sufficiency, and assuming that people care both about weather causation, or necessity, and sufficiency, we can make sense of the overall pattern results. Um, as, as people in 10 bombs that like to do at the end, just like, show like a lot of data, we don't really explain it, but <laughs> no, we don't, we don't explain it. But this is just, obviously I just showed you a few example cases. This experiment overall had 32 different flips, and they made judgments about both of the different balls, and what you just hopefully see is that the black bars are very close to those other bars for, for most of the cases, so the model does a pretty good job overall of capturing uh, people's other judgments. Um, yeah, just to wrap up, so I, I told you about this complex simulation model, showed you that it's quantitatively accurate, like there's a high correlation between common factual and, and causal judgments. Gave you some process evidence, and that, that may actually be what people are doing when they're um, making these causal judgments. Um, told you a little bit about these more complex cases, where I would like to think of these different things that I'm introducing as different aspects of causation. They're not fundamentally different from each other, they're all operating on the same generative model of this world, like the physics world, the only way in which they differ from each other is that they consider different common factual operations like over this world, but not fundamentally different. And what I didn't get to talk about was um, that, that I'm also using this framework in order to make sense of different causal terms that people may be using, like the difference between helping, enabling, and causing 